So it's good to have you all with us this morning on this snowy morning. We're starting a brand new series today called Unwrap. We're going to be looking at the Christmas story, maybe hopefully from a little bit different angle, and uh, maybe telling you and sharing some things with you that maybe you never thought of before, maybe you never heard before. I don't know. How many of you remember the slogan, or you've heard the slogan, don't judge a book by its cover? When I was first getting into reading, when I was in high school and even in college, I, I really didn't enjoy reading at all. I would avoid it as much as possible. And it wasn't until I actually became a pastor, and my dad talked one time, he said, son, you're a pastor now, you need to start reading. You need to read everything you, you, you can read. doesn't matter what, just read it and get it out there so you're educated and keep learning. And, uh, being a pastor and leading a church and all that stuff is a, is, is a constant learning process. It's a constant time of, of seeing what other guys are doing, seeing what's going on in our world and everything else and keeping up on it. So I decided to start picking up books and then I found I actually really enjoy reading. So I came across this one the other day that says, don't judge a book by its movie. So many times we let popular treatments of something such as a film or a YouTube clip, be the final word on something. Kind of like the Christmas story, right? Could it be the story you thought you knew? I think for many of us it is, beginning with what you thought you knew about Mary and Joseph. So let's start looking at what the Bible tells us, beginning with the first introduction of Mary. This comes from the book of Luke. It's in your notes. It'll be on the screens. Book of Luke, chapter 1. It says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, believe it or not, that verse tells us a lot about Mary. First of all, and this is what we all know about the story. First of all, give that to me on the screen there. First of all, Mary was a virgin. We, we know that part of the story. I mean, if, if you've been around church, even if you haven't been around church, most everybody knows this part of the story. She was a virgin. But second, she was pledged to be married. Write that down. She was pledged to be married, meaning she was engaged. Now, I don't want you to rush past that, okay? Back then, a Jewish betrothal period was much more significant and binding than today's engagement periods. Weddings were actually a kind of a three-stage event. First of all, you were pledged. I put these in your notes. First of all, you were pledged. This could happen as early as 12 years of age. Usually the parents of the bridegroom would approach the parents of the bride, and then would come the betrothal. What we would equate today with the engagement period. But this was a lot different than our engagements today. While there were no sexual relations during this time between the people pledged, there was just about everything else. The man could already call her his wife and often did. In fact, in Matthew's Gospel, Joseph and Mary are talked about as husband and wife before they're even married. And that was appropriate for the day because of the serious nature of the pledge that they had with each other. In fact, the betrothal period could only be broken by divorce or if one of the two parties died. And if a woman's fiancé died during the betrothal period, she was considered a widow. Now the third phase was the actual marriage, which usually happened one year after you were betrothed. But it was almost a formality as the woman could actually begin living with your family not in a sexual relationship, but actually move in with you and your extended family as your wife prior to the marriage itself. Which brings us to another bit of information. This is next in your notes there. And it's that Mary was young and Joseph was old. So theirs was what we like to call a May-December romance. And by our standards, he was probably very old, and she was probably very young. She may have been as young as 13 years old. 
And we know that because engagements usually took place immediately after entering puberty. So Mary would have entered that in her teens, 12, 13, 14, uh, maybe as late as 15. And Joseph was much, much older, which explains why we don't know anything about Joseph once Jesus is an adult. Now, there's an old tradition, and I want you to understand this. This is not in the Bible. Okay, everybody hear me? This, what I'm going to tell you right now, is not in the Bible. It's an old Jewish tradition. But the tradition says that Joseph lived until he was 111 years old, dying when Jesus was 18. That he had been married with children beforehand, before Mary, but that his first wife had actually died, and that would make him a very elderly man, which would have made Mary about 13 and made Joseph about 92. Now sometime between the time Jesus was 12 and 30, Joseph apparently died. Now the last record of Joseph is when Jesus was 12. Now remember that tradition I just told you. That's not in the Bible, okay? It's a Jewish tradition. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I thought it was very interesting to know. Because the last record that we have of Joseph is when Jesus was 12. Now the next scene from the life of Jesus in all four biographical accounts of the life in the Bible is when Jesus was 30 and begins his ministry. And in all accounts of Jesus' life, not a word is mentioned of Joseph at all during that time. When Jesus returns home, when Jesus interacts with, with, with Mary, no Joseph. And on the cross, before his death, Jesus asks John to watch over Mary. The only reason why he would have done that is if Mary had been a widow. Some interesting things to think about. Which tells us, so we know now, Mary was a widow. And that sometime between the ages of, of 12 and 30, probably in Jesus' teen years, Joseph died. But not only was Joseph old, and not only was Mary very young, but they were poor. Actually very poor, and we know this from a scene that took place on the 40th day after the birth of Jesus, when they took him to Jerusalem to present him before the Lord. Kind of like an infant dedication. Take a look at this. This is from Luke 2. It says, When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves and two young pigeons. So here's what was going on. Following the birth of a son, the mother was to wait 40 days before going to the temple to offer a sacrifice for the purpose of her purification. And the purpose was to consecrate the baby to God. As part of that dedication, it was common to give a sacrifice or an offering to God. We're told that they chose a pair of doves or a pair of pigeons, which is how we know they were poor. The most common sacrifice was a lamb. And if you brought something else, you actually had to get special approval to bring something else. Because a lamb was the appropriate thing to breathe. Now, if you go back to the law and you read in the book of Leviticus and all that stuff about the law and everything, you'll, you'll learn and find out that they were allowed to bring either doves or pigeons. They had to bring the best that they could. But if you brought a dove or a pigeon, you actually had to go to the priest and get special permission to do that. And it was to show forth that you couldn't afford a lamb. You couldn't afford to bring that sacrifice. Which shows us that Mary and Joseph were very poor people. So they were a May-December couple. They were poor. But did you notice what else? This is next, you know. Mary was from the city of Nazareth. Now, while Nazareth is very well known to us today, it was rather obscure then. Not a large place, it was a small little village then. And those who did know about it, they didn't think too highly of Nazareth. Nazareth didn't have a good reputation in that day. If I told you I was raised in the Bronx, or I was a Southie from Boston, or I was from East L.A., what would you think? Might color some things for you, right? You might think of me in, in a little bit different light. 
Well, later on in the Bible's record of the life of Jesus, we actually read that when people heard of Jesus of Nazareth, because that's how they identified people then. In other words, I would have been, if I was living in that town, I would have been Andrew from Portage, because I was born in Portage, Michigan. Their first name and where they were from, they said, Nazareth? Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? In fact, the word Nazarene in that day was synonymous with someone who was despised. Now finally and most importantly, they both faced some very defining moments that altered the entire trajectory of their lives. There are certain things that we can do within the course of our lives that transcend time itself in such a way that what we do with the moment creates enormous impact or carries enormous significance for our life as well as the life of others. In fact, because of their belief in this, the ancient Greeks had, actually had two words for time. I put these in your notes. One is chronos. That's where we get our word chronological from. This referred to calendar time, days, weeks, months, years. What we usually think of when we use the word time. This is what we're referring to most of the time. But then they had a second word for time, and it was the word keros. A word that meant something very different, something a lot deeper, so different that we don't even have in our English language the equivalent of it. So what is keros about? Keros has to do with quality of time. It is time filled with opportunity. It is a moment pregnant with eternal significance and possibility. It's a moment when we are confronted with a choice or decision or potential action that holds the deepest level of significance for who we are, for who we are becoming and what our life impact will be. Simply put, it's a time when we make a choice and then the choice makes us. Which is why the Bible teaches us the following truth in the next verse you see there printed on your outline. It comes from Ephesians chapter 5. It says, be very, there, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Carols. And this is what marked Mary and Joseph more than anything. Their carols moments. First, I want you to think of Mary for just a second. Put yourself, everybody, put yourself in Mary's shoes for a minute. An angel comes and tells her that she found favor with God. That she is going to have a baby conceived by the Holy Spirit. A son. And she is to give him the name Jesus. Now, that wasn't the defining moment. That wasn't the defining moment for Mary and Joseph. But the next verse tells us what was. Look at Luke 1, 38. It says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. I want you to let that sink in for just a minute. Let that sink in for just a minute. She lived in a small town. In a small town. Most of us here, all of us here, we live in small towns. I know that a lot of you think of Marshfield as a big town. I do not classify Marshfield as a big town. Um, I've lived in big towns. I grew up in South Jersey. Uh, I've lived in big towns. So this is not a big town. What happens in small towns? Scandal. Everybody knows everybody else's business. Mary faced a scandal. She would have to tell her parents. She would have to tell Joseph. And who could possibly believe this? I mean, think about Joseph for a minute. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes for just a second. Here you are engaged, betrothed to a woman. And she comes to you and tells you, hey Joseph, I'm pregnant. But I didn't do anything with another man. It's the Holy Spirit. What's going through your mind? Yeah, right. That would have been my response. Wouldn't that have been yours? Yeah, right, Mary. You expect me to believe that an angel from heaven, this is, 
th- th- this is where when we get into some of these stories in the Bible sometimes, and they're not stories, they're truth. We believe what the Bible teaches. But we get into these talks of the Bible sometimes, and we go, that's impossible. And we look at some of these things and we think, at least for me, I think, it's no wonder why sometimes people just don't believe what we're saying. And the angel from heaven comes down to Mary, who's probably 13, 14, maybe 15 years old, says, hey Mary, you have found favor with God, so therefore the Holy Spirit is going to come and impregnate you. Okay, Mary and Joseph. If I'm Mary, I'm going, I probably wouldn't have said, yep, sure, let it happen. Would you? I don't know, I'm not a woman, so I don't know. Probably not. But you see, Joseph had a choice now. Joseph had a choice to make. And legally, Joseph could have gone to Mary. When Mary comes and says, hey, I'm pregnant, and Joseph goes, what? Joseph could have legally divorced her that particular moment. And that's not all. In that day and time, the penalty for adultery was death. Death by stoning. So she knew she would have to endure scandal, probably divorce, and even possible death. So keep that in mind as you read the words, may it be to me as you have said. Now, think of Joseph. The Bible tells us through Matthew's account of the story that Joseph was going to divorce her quietly when she told him the news. And that tells us something of Joseph's spirit. He only had two options. To be considered righteous, he couldn't marry her. Because that would be considered an affirmation of her adultery. According to the law, he could do one of two things. He could divorce her publicly, making the reasons known, put her to shame and possibly even death. That would allow him to do the right thing by himself, make himself look really good, but at Mary's expense. Or he could divorce her quietly so that no one would know the reason, possibly even sending her away. Now, this would allow him to do the right thing personally and do the best that he could for Mary. At personal risk to himself, though, being seen as someone who was basically stood up on his wedding day. Joseph chose a quiet divorce. But then he too had a visit from an angel. And the angel told him that it really was a God thing. And that she should take Mary as his bride. And now he too had a choice, didn't he? He had a choice. And he made it. Joseph accepted this baby by faith. Just like Mary. And he remained betrothed to her. And then he went a step further. He took her home as his wife. And then did everything he could to care for her, including taking her with him to Bethlehem for the census. Very compassionate. You see, the movies make it seem like they went in that ninth month just when they got to Bethlehem just in time for her to have that baby. And then as soon as she had that baby, bam, they left right afterwards. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, all the Bible says is that while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. We don't know how long in advance of Jesus' birth Joseph left to go. What probably happened is they went just before her third trimester, before Mary really began to show, and Joseph took her with him. And at that time, because they didn't want her enduring the ridicule of being seen as someone who somehow got pregnant outside of marriage because, folks, people do the math. Joseph wants to protect her. So they probably stayed in a crowded room in a home of some poor relative until the birth of the baby necessitated their vacating it for privacy and for more space. And it was then, as they sought that place at an inn, any inn at this point in time, that they found there was nowhere for them to go. So there you have it. Maybe a little bit about the story that maybe you didn't know. But hopefully this all becomes more than just trivia. Maybe there's a little about the story for you that you didn't know was there. Let me ask you a question. 
If God sent an angel and said, I have something that I want you to do. And doing it would mean the loss of loved ones. Scandal and ruin of your reputation. Maybe even imprisonment and death. Would you do it? Would you do it? Now there's two ways to consider answering that question. One is through the eyes of reason. And the other is to the eyes of revelation. You see, when you make a choice based on reason, you look at what you have, do some calculations, and find out what is reasonable, affordable, most advantageous, advantageous, I can't say that word this morning, apparently, and you do it. You just make out that T-chart, right? The pros and the cons, and go with what promises the biggest payoff. No faith is involved at all because no God is involved at all. See, that's life by reason. But then there's life by revelation. When you do something by revelation, you go to God in prayer and ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to give? How do you want me to serve? Where do you want me to go? Because whatever it is, I'll do it, God. That's not a T-chart. That's a bungee jump. That's faith. It's confidence and trust in God. And if reason is based on the idea that nothing is worth dying for, revelation is based on the idea that you don't have to live at all. It's based on the idea that the ultimate goal of life is not to survive. Did you catch that with Mary and Joseph? Did you catch that? That wasn't the operating principle. There was no sense of self-protection going on. I don't mean they were reckless or or, or pursued risks and thrills for their own sake. And when you look at their life, when you look at their life, you find that they followed God's leadership with complete abandon. They went through life knowing that they didn't have to preserve their life. They just had to live. They knew that their life was not meant to be cultivated, but spent. And when that's the operating in your life, Everything changes, doesn't it? Everything changes. So where? Where are you operating on reason and God is calling you to operate on revelation? Where? There's probably a lot of space in your notes because they're really short this week. Write it down. Make it real. Where are you operating on reason and not on revelation. Is it a career decision? Is it a financial decision? Maybe it's a decision about a relationship. Where is God giving you the chance to say, may it be to me as you have said? It's a Kairos moment. Don't miss it. You see, this is the beginning of the Christmas story. We're going to unwrap this over the course of the next few weeks, ending on Christmas Eve. Pray. Father, we thank You for this time that we can come to You, God, and look at the Christmas story. Look at Mary and Joseph. See what's going on in their lives. And Father, I just pray that as we unwrap this story over the course of the next few weeks, that each and every one of us maybe maybe looks at this story from a little bit different perspective. Maybe we see something that we've never seen before. Maybe something becomes real to us again. Today, as we looked at Mary and Joseph and saw that they basically sat back and said, may it be done to me as you want, God. That was their defining moment. In all of us in our life, we have defining moments, whatever they are. Whatever they may be. Maybe God's calling you to take a step of faith that you've been reasoning out over the course of the last year or two or three or four or five. You've been reasoning out these thoughts that have been going on in your mind and God's saying, take a step. Take a step of faith. 
step across that line, do a bungee jump of faith, because I've got greater things for you. If you just take that step of faith. Maybe for some of you, that step of faith you have to take is coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. Maybe you've never taken that leap, that bungee jump, to say, all right, God, I've been reasoning out my mind why it'd be better not to follow you. But you know what? This morning, right here, right now, we're getting ready into Christmas season. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus, and I've known for a long time that I've needed to take this step of faith and ask Jesus to come into my life, to be Lord of my life. And if that's you, quietly, right where you're sitting, I just want you to pray, just you and God. Just follow me in this prayer. Let me just say this before we get to the prayer. This is not some magical prayer that we pray. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. And so that's why we pray. We confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And if that's you, would you pray with me this morning? Allow Jesus to come into your life. He came to this earth for one purpose, and that was for you. To die in your place for you so that you could have life. And life everlasting with Him in heaven. If that's you, would you pray with me right now? Just say, Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth. Dying for me so that I can have eternal life. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just take that little tear off? Would you mark that little box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ. We're so excited for you. We want to help you on this journey of knowing and understanding what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for this time that we can come December 4th, start talking about the birth of Jesus. That we can get our minds focused on the reason why Jesus came. The real reason that we celebrate Christmas. So Father, as we unwrap this story over the course of the next few weeks, I pray that all of us would just come with open minds and maybe learn something.